Hello, and for the last time, welcome to the Game Development Project Lecture Notes. So, on this last lecture video, we will be talking about gamification and serious games. Now, this is yet another larger uh, theory set, so uh, this might be uh, a huge thing to watch through one sitting. But the idea here is that we, on this lecture, are going to be talking about everything related to the application of games in the software industry. So basically going vice versa on the typical topic of this course, where we have been talking about how we can apply our existing software skills in the games development. So on this lecture, gamification, serious games, game for design, and so on and so on, are discussed and also uh, pondered based on how we can use things we might learn from games on development and design of user interfaces, user experience, and also what we can do in general to manage user experience or how the person perceives the software. Of course, with games, we have levels and progressions in gamification, we also have uh, different types of achievements, uh, prizes, and stuff like that. But how we can use this information to leverage on our user experience design. And like always, uh, keep in mind that this lecture or this video is meant for the entire academic year of 22 to 23. So this uh, exam, now this material will be part of this academic year's exam. You will be getting a 20 question uh, multiple choice questionnaire, uh, which has been randomly assigned from a pool of la larger pool of similarly difficult assignments. And of course, while this theory, of course, doesn't change between the years, if there are some small details which have changed it's better and it's important actually that you always uh, follow the guidelines and the instructions on the Moodle pages and uh, not the instructions on these videos. We talk about theory here and the how the courses are practically run, which are the deadlines, what you have to do and when are always on the most recent implementation of the course in Moodle. So without further ado, let's move to today's agenda. So going into the uh, serious side of games industry, uh, the entire idea of this speech is to give you an idea on how uh, game, uh, the gameful design, games, gamification is also used in somewhere else than just entertainment software. The, on the previous lectures, we have been talking about how games are designed, for example. And it's apparent that the games are designed only to entertain or provide user experience to the user. However, uh, due to being a significant uh, part of software industry, in a sense that the games are already a, or games industry is actually already quite large, and it's something that's uh, definitely going to be a career for several people in the software industry. Uh, it has leaked into the designs, for example, for web pages and uh, software and things. Also, uh, on serious games aspect, we have been doing learning games and stuff like that forever. For example, the chess game, uh, the traditional board game, which is at least uh, 300, 400 years old uh, on its current form actually uh, has started as a sort of a strategy game or strategy uh, exercise for upcoming leaders and colonels and generals of the armies. Anyway, uh, what is gamification, serious games and games for health? So, uh, gamification, it was a catch-all term or this uh, marketing gimmick for many things a couple of years ago. It has a bit uh, 
uh, not died down, but calmed in a sense that not everything is now gamified in gamification. And basically, the uh, high current of the trend has passed us, but it doesn't mean that the gamification isn't something that's going to stay with us. So basically, it's a catch-all term describing an act of bringing game-like elements into systems, which traditionally may not have such things. Learning environments, web stores, uh, online casinos, whatever you may have it, it uh, brings aspects from the design or user retention or using the positive feedback loop somehow into making the users do more, commit more, spend more money or be more interested in towards completing some objectives like completing the courses or answering to the surveys or spending their money online, whatever. Uh, you name it, it's probably some uh, form of gamification. The technical term, which, is ac which was actually coined by Finnish uh, researchers from Tampere University, is the game that the gamification is a form of service packaging where our core service is enhanced by a rules-based service system that provides feedback and interaction mechanisms to the user with an aim to facilitate and support the user's overall value creation. Well, sort of an academic de description, but still, anyway, uh, it's, a, it's an additional thing for something that already exists. The core service is enhanced by adding gamification features uh, with the aim that it actually supports the user's uh, activities, whether it's motivation or how much they've spent money or time online. And it creates value for the user. So the user finds it something else than just an annoyance, which sometimes it becomes if it's done poorly or if it's enforced to users, because not everything, uh, even if almost everything can be gamified, it doesn't mean that everything should be gamified. Anyway, there's a couple of ways to distribute these things. I like to use this idea because it more or less is the one that Huotari and Hamarimi uses. So basically it divides things, software, services, items into a number of things, whether it's a whole or parts of the system that is gamified or game-like. And it also differentiates between gaming or games and playing and toys. So basically, uh, if you have an entire system uh, defined based on playing around, it's a toy. But if you have an entire system, which is basically a game, it's a, well, either video game, or if it's somewhat uh, aimed towards something serious, it's surprisingly serious game. Serious games being games that actually make you do something like physiotherapy or learning how to drive or learning the rules of the road or learning how to navigate your boat or something like that. If you have to actually learn some real life skill or uh, do uh, exercises which enhance, enhance your health or replace uh, some uh, exercise or training sessions, then we are talking about serious games. If we are only talking about parts of the system being a game, it's a game for design and gamification. If uh, on these two terms, you have to understand that the game for design and gamification basically are synonymous to each other, but the gamification is the more or less the umbrella term for everything, whereas game for design is basically a design approach where you design your product or the user interface around something that's more or less gameful or joyful or based on the fact that you are making a product or service which uh, applies gamification ideas. The playful design, on the other hand, is something like using toys to design real things or using toys or board games to enhance your organization, for example, find problems in your software process or rearrange your management needs or something like that. Uh, it doesn't exactly sound like it's a very laboratory thing, but still, uh, for example, organization design or organization workshops sometimes use these approaches where they are 
uh, using board, custom board games or, for example, Lego blocks for getting people to talk and understand the basic problems. That's playful design. It's doing something serious with toys, whereas gameful design or gamification is doing something serious with games or game-like approach. If we are talking about the real, well, not real, but the traditional software, it isn't it doesn't exist on this divisioning because it this expects that you we are actually doing either play uh, playful design or game design to the entire system or parts of the system. If we were to consider where the traditional software is, it's on the third axis on it is uh, and it's uh, about if we are how much gaming or playing we are doing and uh, if we are not doing that then we are probably doing some traditional designs so uh, there's a sort of a uh, summary on what these things are the important part here is that there's even if there's number of studies about gamification or serious games or playful design uh, they more or less are all things that are not very much defined. They include several aspects of design and they and some system, if, even if it's a serious game, it can include gamification or playful design can be used somewhere well, even if we don't actually create a thing which applies gamification. So these are more or less just concepts for the software design and as we know from, for example, the software engineering course, uh, they can be used also in other places than on the end product. For example, the playful design can be used somewhere where we are just doing requirements a collection or requirements analysis or trying to find enhancement proposals for the future process or the product or service or whatever. On the other hand, uh, the serious games might actually be based on real life uh, training simulator or something like that and actually train you to do something. For example, there's a borderline of whether the flight simulator which trains you to fly a real Airbus plane, whether it's a serious game or a simulation because more or less you can learn how to fly a plane and you can do something that's more or less just a hobby or playful design. On the other hand, there's also games, simulation, flight simulator games, which more or less can simulate the entire fighter jet system. So the, uh, uh, the border between training simulator and serious game or a flight simulator, which is a more or less of an entertainment thing, becomes a more or less vague but still, these concepts uh, propose approaches, and it's not, it's not always uh, defined or dictated that it actually has to provide something. For example, if we are doing gamification and gameful design, we might make the design saying that we will be doing this, but it's, it's usually designed in a way that you can either opt out of the system or its addition to the existing service, or it's something that the user is capable of choosing not to participate in, like the bonus card system in most of the Finnish retail stores, because some people really, really hate gameful design. For those audiences, the gameful design might be just completely skipped, or if some feature is not well received, then you can just remove it and not offer it to anywhere. So keep in mind that the, we are only doing uh, user interface design, user interface principles, and also requirements collection and this requirements analysis when we are doing or dealing with the gamification or design approaches. In any case, uh, I have shown this slide several times. So game development and software development share common features, design development tools, so on and so on. So uh, more or less, uh, the gamification is an additional step to this. It's something that's actually a game design in software development. So uh, 
from the game development, we take the emphasis on customers, the customer expectations, the customer uh, and user uh, experience uh, to the uh, core of our design. Uh, for example, uh, if we do gameful design, we are more or less trying to engage the user to spend more time or money or be more interested in or be more uh, influenced by the service. In a sense that the customer retention rate grows, the customers spend more money, time and their resources to participate or stay online in our service or product. So we bring from the game development the ideas that we emphasize on their expectations, we emphasize on their competitiveness, we emphasize on their need to uh, collect something so that they can achieve their objective, get something that's not available to those who don't participate, or get something that's usually costly or costs money for free because they did something and participated more. We try to use the gam uh, get the gambling sense uh, enabled or to uh, make people uh, give the uh, users the opportunity to show that they are these uh, much better fans or more participating people or more uh, experienced users than others. Or simply that I'm, I run more than you, so I'm morally more, uh, I'm better person than you because I have done more exercises. I have done more uh, running laps, I have done more uh, gym exercise events and so on and so on. So competitiveness and these sort of things are brought in to make people participate. Also, it's, uh, it usually involves artistic vision or artistic design, something that appeals to users. It, there's a debate if it's necessary to actually have a artistic approach or how much this affects the gameful design or gamification aspects. But I'd argue that you still need to consider for the user experience, which is important for the gamification, I'd say that the artistic vision or idea on how people uh, would react to certain styles of presentation is still very important for successful gamification. Also, testing with users and uh, stuff like the Sound design, for example, goes to the user experience feedback. On the sound design, it might actually sound a bit crazy here, but for example, some form of gamification can be very simple. Something like the trash can saying thank you when you throw your paper cup into the can. It's successful gamification. That's actually one of the archetype of gamification. And it's more or less the design of the uh, user uh, expectations or user experience. You make a trash can say something nice to you every time you throw something in there instead of just leaving it lying around on the park. It's actually something that engages the people because the system provides positive feedback loop on doing something that's beneficial. Anyway, uh, it also means that we, if we all want to do gamification, we want to have someone who is actually fairly good at this. If we just do something that the engineers think that might work, it won't, uh, it probably uh, misses the point or isn't as good as we would probably want it to be. So uh, the idea is still, uh, is the game fun or is the product engaging? Is the uh, gamification aspect of the design something that engages the right uh, audiences, the right customers, the clients, does it enhance the user experience in some meaningful way? For example, if you throw your trash to bin and the bin thanks you, that's of course nice. If you walk up the stairs, you can play the piano, that's something that gives people things to be interested in about, or they might actually want to just try out the piano thing even though using elevator would probably be more convenient to them, or at least not as exhausting as using the long flight of stairs. So basically the uh, fundamental idea 
of is the product engaging and is the game fun or is if, if, if the user experience is what we prefer or want to have. Is this positively reinforcing the behavior that engages the user to participate is actually something that's fairly important for the gamification. And of course, this is something that comes uh, directly from the game development or the game industry school of design. Uh, if we are talking about software design, we might not have this sort of approach. What are the requirements? How do we fulfill them? Do we have the quality criteria correct? And so on and so on. But is the product engaging? Is the positive feedback loop actually functioning? Or is it reaching the right customers or the people we want to reach? And uh, steering the customers or users towards the activities we want them to do is actually aspect on the gamification itself. So, shortly, uh, of course we can use gamification uh, for several things, but these are more or less the things that the gamification or game from design is actually usually used. We want to enhance the user retention rate. So I mentioned on the second lecture that if we take 200 customers or users who download your product and start it for the first time, one of those 200 people actually spends money on your product. Uh, five, six of them spend some euros somewhere, but usually doesn't pay for anything. And there's a couple of uh, about uh, 30, 40 people who might every now and then boot up your product. Of course, uh, the numbers, if we are talking about software products or services, which have some other inherent use than just entertainment, might not necessarily be exactly the same, but still uh, we are subject to competition. So why would we want to go to the market X when we can go to the market Y or market Z? So how do we uh, get the users or customers to be loyal? Or how do we make them to come back to our website to see our new sales or order something from our web store instead of our competition if the products are similarly priced? And the only thing that actually matters is the current uh, uh, warehouse stock. So wh which one is the one that can uh, provide the product most quickly. Of course, there's a bonus programs, but on the other hand, everyone have, has bonus programs. So the idea is that we make something that enhances the interest towards the product. So we make the user retention rate higher. We get more of a larger percentage of our users to come back and use our product. On the other hand, it might also be something that promotes motivation. Uh, for example, Gamification is used on several uh, self-learning platforms. These platforms vary from being a elementary school things to some uh, self-learning courses on the internet, all the way to the university courses. So if we add gameful design aspects to the products or the courses themselves or the learning platform, uh, we see that the motivational aspects rise. The students tend to do more work, turn in more exercises, actually participate more, or even if we are do, using this in a context, context of actual software development, we might see that our developers actually uh, turn in more tickets if we have sort of a raffle at the end of the week for all the turn, uh, tickets which have been completed. Of course, uh, this also might have some uh, backlash issues, and there's a actually bad ways of using gamification, uh, but that's on the latter part of the lecture. The design, on the design aspect, the promote motivation of engaging or using the product more is actually one of the reasons. Finally, more sessions. So we get our students and users to do more frequent visits, and have more in-depth interest towards our system or the services or the contents or the library or the other things that are provided is of course positive aspect. Combining all these things of course means that it might act the gamification or the successful gamification 
might be the thing uh, differentiating successful websites or services from the ones that fail or at least stagnate because they don't as uh, they they don't uh, have the necessary amount of people or traffic or participation or they because their customers are just there because they can't use anything else or something like that and of course on the long run or open competition that's a bad situation to be in so basically do the gamified elements add something valuable to the user experience? Of course, it might not necessarily add any real value. For example, it might be some system where you can alter your avatar or participate on some meaningless uh, raffle for a coffee package or bucket or something like that every month. Or that the uh, people who participate on the gamified activities reserve some meaningless prizes or additions which are in no relation to how much they actually spend money or in the more frequent visits or longer visit sessions or something like that but still the gamified elements are successful if the user experience is somehow enhanced if the users consider that the elements or that the system is more interesting now that it had, has these elements, then congratulations, you have done successful gamification of your service. So, how have got we come here? Uh, why does everything have to be games? Why does games have to be in everything? This is a valid criticism towards gamification. And obviously, uh, not all has to be gamified. But on the other hand, the gamification is actually a fairly recent idea. That's more or less prob probably because the gameful design and gamification as a term was coined in 2008. And considering published scientific works, uh, there's some data uh, on the uh, existence and the spread of gamified design. For example, in 2010, about two years after the uh, design term was coined in a uh, software design uh, conference, there was one publication. On 2011, 58, then 100 more, then uh, 150 more, again 100 more, and 2015, when this data was collected, uh, we had already been three months into the year and we were reaching 200 pa papers. Of course, doing this uh, analysis again this year would probably give us several thousand papers or designs or proposals or some other things, meaning that it's actually very, very popular school of design, although now that the popularity has a bit uh, recessed due to the boom, original, the first boom of gamify everything being a bit fast. It's a still valid idea on enhancing your product or service or making your website something that's somehow a bit different than your competition. And basically that's more or less everything you need to do about in marketing. On the other hand, uh, being a relatively new thing, uh, in a design uh, as a school uh, design school or approach to make a service or product it's actually interesting to see that there's not no really uh, correct answers yet for example in the 90s when the mobile phones were uh, developed no one really knew what would come up uh, what would uh, what the product would end up looking like the current mobile phone for example is something that was more or less known already in the 90s. This is basically a Nokia communicator that's just cheaper and more accessible to everyone. The original communicator with the, of course, with the exception of the current technology of the, the, the technology of then, did more or less all these things. Only thing that the first one missed was basically the, a camera, which was added on the third iteration. But the interesting part with the mobile phones was that there was no uh, actual truth, truth on what was mobile phone and what would be the killer application or the killer product. 
In fact, Nokia guessed wrong. That's why they more or less died. And uh, well, not exactly true. They died because they were too stubborn to actually accept the fact that their original idea on what the mobile phone is was faulty. But anyway, uh, there was there were several different ways of uh, defining what the mobile phone is, what's the services it's, it's, it needs, what are the things feature it needs, and same with the gamification. Uh, basically, we are currently living at the same stage with the gamification. If we look into the common areas where the research is right now, or well, or has been for a couple of years, uh, it's still on the general theory and elements. What works? Why it works? What should we measure? How should we measure? Uh, the indicators that might give us an idea if the gamification fails or not. Because it's actually surprisingly difficult to define what would be the successful gamification for this thing. It's more common to guess wrong than to get it right. So this is something that's obviously an interest point for several uh, researchers or developers of products and services. There's also different proof of concept studies. So it has been tried out everywhere. Serious games, games for health, crowdsourcing, uh, business studies on how gamification adds to your product, technology hardware studies on what sort of hardware works best on gamified systems, which are not online services or products, and actually e-learning activities. So it more or less still looks for its uh, comfort zone, where the gamification actually works, where should it, should it be used, and actually the domains and areas and businesses and successful gamification stories are still popping up every now and then. So it's completely possible to just find out something new and make a huge amount of money out of, of successful gamification of things. So. There's a couple of ideas on what uh, the different uh, proof of concept areas or domains for gamification are. Of course, computer science teaching, uh, sustainability or in more general terms, ec ecologically friendly lifestyle uh, teaching tool, uh, motivation improvement tools, software development tools to aid the developers uh, to identify requirements or participating in design work and so on. Uh, ways of improving or adding uh, or part, uh, so, uh, users to the, the design process, so enhancing social behavior, for example. Uh, teaching tool for non-engineering areas, e-government, business management, physiotherapy, and history and museums, adding interactive tours, for example, or call it, uh, points for doing this quiz uh, during the history tour, so that this uh, small children will listen. If you complete number of points or get certain score, you always win something, but if you get collect more uh, points, you get a better prize and so on and so on. So basically it's a combination of new technology versus traditional ways of engaging users. For example, on the museum tours, the collection of stickers or stamps or stuff like that. It's not something that hasn't been done before. I think some World Fair in uh, uh, early uh, 20th century already used this collect stamps from the different pavilions and you get a prize or something like that approach. So basically this is just something that has been gamified, made for digital tools, uh, whereas something like computer science teaching tools or tools uh, teaching you uh, sustainability or how to recycle your waste and stuff like that, uh, games or plays around that isn't exactly a new thing, but it's, it's still something that gamification helps or in the domain where the seems to help. There's also further domains, so teaching how you to drive cars or classifying items, being the mechanical term for some other service, by engaging users via gamification to pick the, uh, the pictures which have cars in them or people in them or stuff like that. 
uh, using, doing e-payment things, online publishing, uh, collecting your eating habits and then uh, instructing you how to eat more healthy, uh, assessing your job performance or improving search accuracy. There's a Google game around uh, where you can add words or add your ideas on translations, for example, that's gamification. Speech therapy, so teaching you how to uh, correctly pronunciate R's and S and other things, or forecasting and also music related things, so teaching you how to uh, play an instrument. So basically, the gamification can be applied on almost any domain or gameful design. And there's successful implementations everywhere, but unfortunately there's also uh, non-successful approaches everywhere. So, there's also a couple of uh, areas which can be argued that they are area, uh, some subgroups or places where the gamification theme is applied. For example, crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is an act of using voluntary humans to achieve activities which are impossible or difficult to complete with a computer. The image labeling, for example, is something that used, at least used to be very, very difficult to do with the computer. So this is also something that's done a bit sneakily via recapture and other things. The first picture is probably the one you are actually, is actually used as a security measure and the second picture is something that you are labeling so that it can be used as a security feature in the future. Also uh, about the correct translations of common uh, sayings or things that don't necessarily make sense, which is actually very important translation of Asian languages, Japanese, Chinese, for example, where the direct translation sometimes completely misses the point. Also, something like uh, uh, getting people or users to take pictures with a geotag on from all the uh, places where the road sign is missing or the uh, traffic control lights are gone out or there's a pothole on the road. Mark that, mark that image and you get points when that thing is fixed. If you are the first one to report it, you get the biggest haul of points and so on and so on. So it creates a game around doing, uh, doing manual labor for the city, inspecting the infrastructure and uh, reporting out things that are problematic. And of course, this offers you a leaderboard or some other way of showing that I am participating in my community, I am holier than thou or something like that. But it can also be just a game. So basically it's a form of gamified uh, community service or something like that. Or it can be just a tool which collects uh, statistically more accurate information from the users or the or volunteering people because, for example, the volunteers want to have more accurate translators or something like that. Basically, uh, the concept being a for volunteering as a mechanical Turk, you should look up that if you don't know what the mechanical Turk is. Games for Health are also one area of uh, serious games or game, uh, design, uh, gamification design. It's basically a game which aims to get, make you more healthy via exercise inducing games or promoting healthcare by doing some activities like uh, go to gym, go, go to run somewhere or providing you a narrative for your exercise event. For example, there's an example of game which is a survival horror game, but instead of actually playing it on PC, you play it while you jog around the uh, neighborhood. Also, the scale of the gamification may change. On some simple systems, for example, like the one offered by Nike, it just offers you different themes, backgrounds, trophy, trophies, 
for certain amount of miles run or exercise events completed, or if you participated to certain marathon or stuff like that. It gives you the possibility to brag about your, uh, your successful participations, or it actually might be a full-fledged game, for example, skiing game, which might sound quite boring thing, but it's simply a Nintendo Wii based game where you ski around the scenery. You can go look different things or take different routes, but it's actually wildly popular, for example, with the elderly people who are in a shape that they no longer can go to actually ski, but they used to do that. So that's an exercise game for them. And they know how to ski. They are just old enough and fragile enough so that they can't do it in real life anymore. But they can still do the activities to promote their health and the ex exercise their limbs and back and their muscles by doing that. So basically, these are games for health because they try to get your off the couch and do something. And it's a subgroup because it also includes uh, aspects like that the system has to be accurate enough so that it actually exercises the right groups. This is important, for example, with the physiotherapy, where doing the exercise wrong might be even more harmful than not doing them. So the games for health have additional uh, concerns or considerations in the design or approach in ensuring that the users are actually doing things correctly and not cheating. I mean, for example, with the Games for Health, uh, the, the, it's an old classic uh, using your, uh, putting your uh, step counter or your smartphone on a vibrating platform so that it looks like that the amount of steps is increasing if you have a sort of competition going on that, for example, the, the person who walks most gets a, a paid day off for because they are uh, they want the competition. And this is actually not a sitcom thing. This has actually really happened. And this is also part of the bad gamification, but let's get that a bit further. Finally, MOOCs are also usually gamified. Ne not necessarily. For example, uh, this course, well, it's not really a MOOC, uh, but you can have an online course, obviously, without gamification aspects. It's not that difficult. You just submit everything and congratulations, you get the, uh, uh, the certificate that you completed this course. Of course, that's not gamified in any sense, but usually, actually, the more, or more massive online uh, open courses actually do apply gamification because for several users, or user groups, for example, people who are not university students. They have no incentive of completing the course. Consider that you are working and you just want to learn something, for example, about COBOL programming. You take a MOOC course about COBOL programming and you get a couple of lectures in, sort of learn the basic ideas, uh, enough that you know how COBOL, for example, differentiates from C programming language or Python, you already know. So why would you complete the course? Well, statistics say that you don't. If the only thing that you can get from the co completing the COBOL programming course is the certificate, which you don't need, you just learn the information you need to know and then move onwards, which is, of course, very shitty situation for the university or the organization providing the courses because it shows that people don't complete the course. So we add gamification. It might be a cheap gimmick, but still it's, a, it's something that keeps people involved. There's a game to be played by participating on the programming course. And then you get magically more people completing the course because there's something, some other reason than the certificate to complete the course. And on the open courses, this is actually a huge thing because, uh, for example, even our own uh, statistics show from Finland, FITEC uh, cooperation between universities, that uh, 
almost 90% of students drop out from MOOC courses. They come in, they check what's going on, they get the information they were looking for, and then they never bother to show up again. So this is just a retention tool for that. But anyway, there's a several uh, ways of uh, successful ways to implement gamification. For example, Code Academy offers open gamified courses. And if you enjoy them enough, it might at some point start asking you for money because also they have to sell their services to you. But if they lure you in with their gamified open courses, then you might actually pay for the advanced uh, courses, which are the product, they, which is the product they are actually selling. So let's go to a couple of examples of successful gamification. This is the first more or less thing that proved that gamification might work, the musical stairs. I'm not going to show you an example here, not only because the recording system I'm using doesn't actually support uh, showing YouTube videos, but because there's a wealthy of them. So basically you can take the escalator if you are a lazy person, or you can take the stairs and if you are taking the stairs, the stairs play like a piano keys. Simple enough. But it actually does increase the amount of people taking the stairs, because that makes the stairs more interesting than taking the escalator. So in a way forward sense, it in, in, enhances or improves uh, the people's health, because they like taking stairs more than taking the escalator, even though it's more bothersome and causes them to do slight exercise while they are taking the metro. So it uh, makes people do a physical activity to achieve something meaningless because it provides them with a nice experience of doing something, playing a piano while they climb the stairs. Similarly here, the demon trash can, uh, which is a fairly fucking horrifying design, I mean that it's I, I find that design a bit scary, but still, the talking trash can. This is the one that says thank you uh, when you throw in some trash or says you that you are the uh, 50th person who has thrown away something, so thank you for not littering and stuff like that. This is a very successful approach. Well, not the looks of it. I mean, it's terrifying to small children perhaps, but still, it's a successful gamification. It doesn't do anything else than just say thank you or something when you throw trash in. But it still improves the amount of trash being collected and minimizes the amount of work needed on the play maintenance of the play yard. This have, these things have been adopted basically on every amusement park uh, around the world because they are very successful ways of making people participate. So children actually might even want to throw stuff down the throat because they want to see what the penguin or the other thing is doing. But on the other hand, these are these also have a additional benefit of that you can also always know how full the trash can is because you already have to do electrify things. You have sensors, so you can also have a sensor saying how full the trash can is. So you can also not only minimize or lessen the burden of actually cleaning the play yard, you can also have real-time measurement of how, much, how uh, many of these trash cans actually have to be emptied. So it optimizes the working hours and working time, which brings us to the bad design aspect. On one metropolitan city, they were trying out these smart trash cans so that the, uh, all the trash cans in the city had sensors which told that they are more than 80% full. You need to empty me during the next uh, 24 hours. So the computer calculates the optimal route and calculates the amount of cars needed in, with, in the, with the idea that it minimizes the amount of needed people and needed time to collect all the trash. So, 
the trash cans started to get broken. They were the sensors were bashed, the lids were missing, something weird was happening. And when they actually uh, had investigation on what happened, was that the people collecting the trash were actively harming the trash cans. Why? Because it made their work much more annoying. You knew how many people were needed, you knew where you need to drive, so you couldn't just do your routine route and have half empty trash cans to collect and then drive back and stay the rest of the day at the depot. When you were assigned to a route, it was always full of full or almost full of trash cans, customized routes, and it cut down on overtime because it knew how it knew how many people were needed. So it was actually eating the profits or the uh, salaries of the people who collected the trash. So they were actively harming the system to get back to the old times. But of course, that's another design thing. But this trash, uh, smart trash can itself is fairly elegant and simplistic way of doing successful gamification. Also, something like this, Pitocracy. So, you can play the game for free, or you can get a co uh, coaching service for yourself. It's a simple game. You make a profile and send your exercise events and your weight and your uh, bench press results and stuff like that to a website, which creates you a virtual gladiator or something like that and you can compete against other people in the service. So only thing you get is that you see how much more you have been doing, how much better you are, or could your virtual gladiator win other people on the service based on your own measurements. You can even cheat how much you want to, uh, more or less, because the system doesn't care that much for it, but of course, uh, it has. It, it also ensures that it's more so less realistic. Or you can pay one dollar a day to get help on getting fit, getting more results, having a personal trainer tell you how to train so that your fitness goes up, so your scores go up, and your virtual gladiator is better at its job, and it might even win a tournament which means that you get to have a cool hat on your gladiator on the service profile. Nothing more different. But this is actually a way of uh, implementing gamification on a training service, or service which just is a log for your service uh, training sessions. Also, Code Academy, Duolingo. These were both mentioned uh, both mentioned uh, of the earl or earlier presentation, earlier in the presentation of the lecture. The Code Academy, of course, is a place where you can learn basics of several different technologies, version control systems, HTML5, uh, uh, Python programming language, these sort of things. So basically, uh, anyone can start, anyone can get the first uh, achievements. Uh, get the fundamentals, basics of how to do programming work, and it's completely free and you can do it in a browser. Of course, it's only in English, but still it has more than, I think, uh, 50 million uh, users right now. Also, the Duolingo here is the same thing, but for the languages. Probably most all of us have been uh, playing with the thing. It's, it's simple exercises. You teach, it teaches you how to uh, read or speak some language. It's actually fairly uh, functional. I mean, I have completed the Spanish course, so I can get some basic news items or I read the newspapers or science or stuff like that. And uh, I'd venture a guess that the same thing for French, Germanese, Italian, other languages, it also works. But what is interesting here is that it actually teaches you fairly large amount of language. I mean, the last parts, for example, of the Spanish course, 
include several things which are more or less advanced advanced language. And you have read real clips, for example, from the uh, newspapers or have to listen to real conversation parts. There's actually a bit of a different exercise between the web page and the mobile phone platform. But nevertheless, the Spanish course has a support team of 12 people uh, with the lecturers and teachers included. So 12 people and the service has over 60 million users for the Spanish course. So 12 people are teaching Spanish for the entire population of Italy. We have about 12 lecturers on the software engineering program. So basically, it would be the same thing as our uh, Tite department and teaching everyone in Italy or northern part of Germany how to do programming and stuff like that. That's a huge thing, and that's only one of the languages. Of course, the most popular one, but still very successful design for a service, very successful uh, gamification approach. I mean, of course, there's a, it, it's actually an internet meme that the Duolingo bird comes to harass you if you are skipping the exercises. But still, it's very, very successful gamification. And it's definitely something that you should check out, if not for the languages, but at least for the uh, how they are doing the gamification part, because that's a very successful design. Also, this is something I mentioned earlier. So if you are going to jog around your neighborhood, why just put a Zombies Run game on your smartphone or smartwatch? And, uh, it basically creates a narrative for you to do uh, on your jogging run. So you have your headphones on, it tells you that the horde is coming near you, you have to run faster, so you run faster. You also can collect things automatically from your route. It might tell you that if you run to this corner, you can find some desert loot stash there, and it, it can be mushrooms or eat food or medicine or something like that or it can just generate stuff out of your run and say that you found following stashes on your run. It's actually a fairly unique approach on doing interval training and stuff like that. And it actually, uh, you don't, might not even notice that it's actually trying to get you to do interval running. So it's a fairly sophisticated idea. Unfortunately, this was only a demonstration when the first, or the concept product, when the second generation uh, iWatch to Apple Watch was released. So I haven't checked uh, has this uh, actually been success or not, but it's still an idea on how to use gamification with new technology and combining it with an exercise uh, work. Exercising. So uh, fairly, so fairly successful combination of new technology, gamification, and uh, games for health because it requires you to actually run. The, the map is actually overseeing that you are going somewhere on the jogging exercise. So, so the cheating is not that simple with that one. Okay, so there's a couple of successful ideas presented here. And there's a couple of general design pointers if you want to start gamifying the world. So there's a couple of pointers here. These are all collected from the people who have been doing the first successful gamified products and designs. So even if those books, both of them are about six years old now, it doesn't mean that they are old and stupid stuff. They are more or less about the success stories of what we so about the gamification. So, of course, what you can gamify, or what sort of things you can have there. The achievements. So, you do something, you get an achievement, you get avatars on which you can add clothes, items, stuff like that. New items opening, of course, if you participate or collect things. Uh, badges, uh, boss fights. So, you complete five different tickets on your. Uh, on your version control system and you get to play a small mini game of boss fights or something like that. Collections, uh, doing some combat like the virtual avatars, having a gladiator fight between each other. 
uh, unlocking new content, uh, having more courses or extra activities or things you can do, doing gifts. So I found that you are newcomer to the service, please have this hat. It's on me, I have five of them. Having leaderboards, having levels, having points, having quests, social graphs. So uh, you are on the top 10% of people who participated on the discussions. Congratulations. Having teams which might compete each against each other so that you have a fair pressure that everyone needs to participate or get involved. Or virtual goods. So you get something you can for you which you can trade for something else. So, so there's a number of different things or approaches or concepts you can use on how to complete your gamification. Of course, the 11 for collecting points, having leaderboards, having achievements, maybe badges or avatars are something that's fairly old-fashioned or traditional things. I mean, the avatars have existed as long as for uh, the bulletin boards or the internet talk. Uh, uh, internet forums have existed, so it's just a small modification on top of that. If you are doing something more of a game-like thing, then you might have levels, boss fights, combat, these sort of things. But they more or less are an idea that you open up a mini-game uh, on after you do certain amount of participation or work. Or in the case of uh, Google Translate, I think you are, I think you are flying a spaceship or something like that. And if you uh, provide a translation, which is rejected from, uh, by the uh, community or something completely different, uh, then I think you get less points or stuff like that. Basically, the idea is that it's always uh, positive reinforcement. For example, with the content unlocking, uh, always, you always just unlock stuff. The, if you do a design where you have to participate or something is locked again, you are locked out of features unless you keep participating. That's a horribly stupid idea, so don't do that. In general, the activity cycle, the which I mentioned earlier, the positive reinforcement of user participation is basically this. Uh, you get motivation to do action, you, your action causes feedback, and the feedback gives you motivation. So this is the golden calf of the gamification. You reinforce the positive uh, feeling or positive user experience so that the uh, user do, does more actions, which generates more feedback, which generates more motivation to do more actions. Fairly simplistic stuff, really. But actually, this is fairly difficult to implement, because the problem is not only finding the, that what motivates your target audience, or what motivates them to do something. The action has to be meaningful, but not too difficult. Because, for example, in the open courses, the, if the pro exercises are too difficult, or in a Games for Health applications, the objectives are something that cannot be reached, uh, it of course means that the feedback will be poor or missing, because you don't reach the uh, objectives, and then the user doesn't have motivation to continue, because they have feeling that they failed. But if the steps are too small, then the user doesn't feel that they are progressing, so they get bored with the product because it doesn't offer them any new experiences. So if you are someone who naturally can find the sweet spot, it, would, it will actually make you a build in a short time, short time. So basically, we are talking about this. The flow between the boredom and anxiety. If the difficulty goes uh, Dark Souls immediately, most of the same people completely abandon the product. Of course, we know that the Dark Souls is a very successful game franchise, so at least there are people who enjoy the super hard difficulty. But for the general audience, you need to have the difficulty set so that the game gets more difficult uh, as 
the player gets more skills. In the gamification context, for example, the more familiar the user is with the environment, the more uh, difficult or complex the activity should be. And the reward or feedback, of course, should reflect this complexity. On the other hand, if the difficulty doesn't rise, the player gets bored. The game gets increasingly boring because there's nothing interesting to do. And if the difficulty gets higher faster than player gets skills, the game uh, gets increasingly, the gamer gets increasingly anxious. It's frustrating, it's too difficult, it's annoying. I want to understand, but I'm not good enough to actually, or talented enough to actually play this game or learn with the system. That's a horrifying situation. And unfortunately, on several musical instruments, uh, for example, things that teach you how to play instruments, there's a tendency that on the first five lectures, we learn the three chords uh, C, D, A. And on the uh, sixth lecture, we learn how to play the guitar while it's on fire without teeth, like mentioned uh, on the classical Simpsons joke. So basically, you can't expect too much from your audience. But on the other hand, you have to uh, expect that they at least get something. But uh, if you are designing a web service or something like that, uh, you can't expect the users to gain skills while they are offline. On the, other, on the other hand, you can't repeat the same stuff over and over and over and over again, because that would frustrate a, a, a user and make the game boring. So this is the general problem, especially with the learning games and learning environments. If we want to use it in a car with the gamification, the problem doesn't go away anywhere. In general, this uh, first prepare trial was five level one, two, three. This is something the progression stairs is used everywhere. From the first Super Mario Brothers, where this was more or less literally the first, uh, uh, in each world there were four levels, or was it three levels anyway, and you have a boss fight at the end. Complete the castle, or dip the Bowser in the lava, and you win that world, go to the next world. If you are learning something like the Duolingo Spanish, you do the uh, first into things, uh, man eats apple, woman drinks milk, stuff like that. Then there's the first trial of actually trying to understand what's the feminine and what's the masculine and what's the neutral uh, tense, and then so on and so on and so on. So this is basically used everywhere. But this exists because it works. You have time to learn, prepare new skills, then you are tested, and if you so show sufficient skills, then you are given a new set of skills to learn. No matter if it's an entertainment software, games, you get this uh, in each Assassin's Creed game. There's always a story mission for each of the main features and stuff like that, and then there's a boss fight or more complex get quest where you need to use those features to do something, usually involving killing some uh, as hat, but still, uh, while well, it's an Assassin's Creed, it's not yet exactly meant for not killing or stabbing uh, baddies. But anyway, uh, or if you are learning how to play guitar, or if you are learning how to speak some language. So this is a good design to keep in mind. Also, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there's several, really several ways to fuck this up. I mean, uh, there's huge number of success stories in gamification, but unfortunately there's also several stories with, in which the gamification failed. Uh, my first uh, point here, the pointification here, is actually that you just add number. You have been given this many points for using our service. You can't compare it against anyone if, unless you know someone else who is using it. 
or each time you do some transaction, you get one point. So what? Uh, there's no reason of doing that. Every time you buy something from a grocery store, you get one point. So what does that indicate? How many times you go to store? Does it mean that you are more forgetful or impulse buyer or, or just don't prepare for uh, or pre-plan your meals uh, before, uh, a week before? So the points mean nothing. Also, the Spotlight Stealer is actually fun. Uh, you create so good game around your gamified service that everyone gets involved, but no one gives a damn about the product under, underneath. There's a good example here on the Spotlight Stealer. There was a web store in the United States which sold uh, pet uh, food, accessories, stuff like that for uh, hamsters, cats, dogs, you name it, they had it. But they had a discussion forum or participation forum and bonus program on which every time you posted something, whether it's a question or answer, and you get points, you can add your more things or new things to your avatar. Of course, people were very interested in the discussion forum where they can get an avatar of their favorite dog or cat breed and put stupid hats on them. But no one actually was using the web store. Similarly, there's a, a site where I think that the uh, game was more or less to click the sheep logo of the service. And the more time you click, the more funnier and weirder additions the logo got. So everyone spent time clicking on the logo, seeing what happens if I click it 100 times more. Just basically <laughs> uh, uh, causing a huge traffic on the website itself. But no one actually using the web store itself, because the game of uh, playing around with the logo was more interesting. I'd venture a guess that this is actually something from which the Google originally or might have gotten the idea of having a different customized games and stuff for their logo on the search engine. Anyway, the slave driver is a fairly annoying thing if you are the if you are the user or the worker. If you are the manager, it's a very nice tool to see that your people are actually doing something. So exploitation where? Uh, you need to perform, or if you are on, on the least effective 10%, then you are given a punishment. Or if you don't participate as much as you used to, we will take away this feature. Or we are measuring your performance by playing this game where everyone gets number of points based on the tickets they close or sales they close during this week, and we have a raffle for the best uh, 10 salesmen of the group, also meaning that we will have a punishment for the first people. And the evil gamification actually is an extension of this idea. So we spy or micromanage people, customers, users, employees, uh, with the gamification. We can see what they are doing or we can force them to participate more, do more activities. There's actually an interesting part here. This led into an active uh, terror campaign on one of the Disney resorts in Florida, where the competing laundry and hotel maintenance teams started to sabotage each other because there was a gamified game of how many rooms have been cleaned and how many problems with the hotel have been fixed, meaning that actually the uh, groups started to, for example, use uh, a quick dry glue to uh, break all the locks or the washing machines for the night shift so that they can process laundry, so they can clean rooms because the uh, evening shift wanted to win the grand prize of chocolate bars and free lunch at the uh, hotel cafeteria. And they started to actually harm the business because they were competing against each other. And finally, the content controller. This is the way of uh, ensuring that your website will fail spectacularly. 
So consider that, for example, Verkkokauppapiste.com decides that because you are participating to our campaign, now you have to watch this 30 second video or play this uh, joyful game before you can actually browse the things you want to uh, buy. So the gamification intercepts you, finds out where you are hiding and forces you to enjoy their content before they allow you to do what you were actually doing. Of course, that's horrible design. And that's also the reason why you should be able to opt out from the gamified services. Uh, also, what the gamification is not. Well, it's not just badges and, and achievements. Uh, this is something that's a uh, fairly common mi uh, misunderstanding. We are not just adding points or leaderboards or badges or achievements and calling it a gamification. Yes, it's a fairly popular or fairly common way of doing gamification, but the gamification itself is the idea that we en en uh, enhance the positive feedback loop, make the user more interested in or willing to participate, not just adding badges or achievements. On learning aspect, we don't expect the approach to trivialize the learning process. If we are doing MOOCs or courses with gamification, it's because we want the students to participate more, want to read the content more thoroughly, or complete, uh, have the higher percentage chance of actually completing the course, not because we want to make the learning process trivial. Real learning is hard and gamification helps with the motivational aspects. This helps with the learning aspects because if you have motivation, you want to find out and you will learn as a part of the process. And as mentioned earlier, the uh, gamification is not something that was the was invented in 2008. It's something that has existed before. The gamification, gameful design is only a name or design school of uh, software, <coughs> hardware, service and product design, which was as a name invented in 2008. But the war simulations, war games, these like, things like these have existed since seventh century. So even in the Middle Ages, the Dark Middle Ages, armies or the commanders were training with some sort of war games. Or the amount of our, uh, soldiers or the capabilities of the soldiers were assessed with some sort of a simulated war or some simulated battle or having exercises or war games or strategy games where, with, where, which were played only with the wooden uh, pieces and map. This is not something new, it's, a, it's not a new concept, it's just that bringing the simulations and designs into all different products and domains. And finally, it's not easy to implement. This uh, one hour and 20 minutes this lecture took is only an introduction to the idea. When you want to do gamification, you have to understand what your customers want, what your users want. What's the user experience that is expected? How it can be enhanced or can it be even enhanced? Do your users even want gamification or do they just don't know that they want the gamification? What would be successful and so on and so on. It's uh, the badges achievements score is easy thing to do. And it's commonly done because it's the most uh, probable way of not Har act actively harming your uh, business or product or service. But it's not successful gamification unless it actually creates the beneficial results. Okay, so uh, if you can get or create feedback, which is tactile, it gives the uh, useful information, it's inviting and it's repeatable, meaning that it gives, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, uh, it gives useful information on all the scenarios. It's coherent, it's continuous, it's emergent based on whatever the user is doing. You get some, give some feedback. It's balanced to 
give every user some uh, useful or reachable goals without actually feeling that it's not progressing enough and fresh meaning that these users get a bit of varying different feedback even if they com do completely same activity or achieve completely the same outcome then you are probably creating feedback which generates motivation if you don't have a give the positive vibe or uh, if you don't give the idea that the user is progressing or that the feedback is tailored right to them then it's meaningless it doesn't achieve the requirements that the user isn't engaging because they just get the uh, standard congratulations letter or that we are very pleased that you have participated in this activity please do it again it's not a feedback it's just a garbage message which doesn't generate any interest or motivation towards using the product but if you create something that fulfills all these criteria positive uh, note fresh balanced emergent uh, you can give it continuously uh, even on completed or, or partially completed or started uh, activities uh, so that it the system repeatedly gives the feedback it's inviting so the positive vibes on it and tactile meaning that it's timely it's something that out seems that it's really based on what you did then that feedback might even generate the motivation so that the user does actually something and, uh, uh, and uh, engages with the product, which means that your uh, gamification is successful. And of course, more about, because we have a very limited time here, and there's several books of design, the Cup book and the, uh, the other book mentioned on the slides are very good ways to start on if you want to do more about gamification. I think that both of them are available on our university library and at least the other one is freely available via our library services. So the Verbach and the Verbach book uh, for the win, successful gamification is at least something that you should look into. It also gives you more practical ideas on how to implement this feedback or the motivation loop. And so there you have it so this is the end of the theory part of this course so after this lecture video you can either start over from the first one or perhaps you might want to move towards doing the project works so keep in mind that the exam is supposed to be the last thing you complete on this course so first come up with your selection of tools on which type of game you want to develop make the game design document and submit those as project one then develop the, uh, your game and submit that uh, put it also available to the course arcade if you want to have other users to be able to test out and see your game and then complete the course exam and wait for the final grade so that's it. The last slide of the last uh, lecture set of this course. So it has been pleasure to talk with you and uh, I hope you will find the rest of this course as interesting that I found when, when I was doing my uh, research work in the games studios right after completing my dissertation. Keep in mind that the games industry is like uh, has been said just a one area where software development can be used but my personal opinion is that it's one of the more creative areas where you can use your software development skills and of course at least somewhere somewhere where you we are not making boring stuff if we are making boring stuff we are way, uh, failing we are making things that interest people interest those who are want to see and try out what we are doing or at least hopefully interest them so in any case thank you for watching these videos now it's your turn to complete and submit your project works and complete the exam 
and uh, if you need help contact the course personnel send uh, messages to the help desk forum go to Moodle and check if there's other people who might be able to help you or who have asked earlier similar types of questions if not then contact course assistant and book a meeting with them and uh, overall don't worry about it your game is going to be just fine so for the last time have a nice rest of the day and goodbye